Good afternoon, everyone. We apologize for the late start, but welcome to our discussion today. Um, my name is Josephine Garden. I'm on the Pax Christi National Council. I'm originally from Sierra Leone, and I live here in Maryland. I'm also with Pax Christi Metro DC, Baltimore. So I'm going to just do a little bit of um, as we prepare for our discussion, I want us to consider this as a sacred discussion. The dialogue will be of mutual blessings to all the panelists and to our attendees. Our panelists, we kindly ask you speak from the heart. The space and energy we bring and the discussion in itself will be prayerful. We will be open to listen actively and deeply to each other, and in that capacity, be open to learn from one another. Honesty about issues must consider the well-being, emotions, and dignity of all participants. We let go of the temptation to defend or offend. Forgiveness and healing must be the order of the day. Gratitude, graciousness, good humor, Honesty and openness are virtues of the dialogue we will have today. Just to make sure everyone is in the right room. Our workshop is practicing nonviolence and interfaith conversation for peace and justice. We are also honoring Saint Josephine Bakita. You'll see her picture over there. I'm just gonna give a brief overview of Saint Josephine. On October 1, 2000, Pope John Paul II canonized Josephine Bakita, a Sudanese woman, freed slave, Pronotian daughter of charity, flower of the African desert, patron of Sudan, and by her own self-designation, a daughter of God. She described her family, her parents, three brothers and three sisters, as happy, reasonably prosperous, and very well respected in their village of Algosa. The Diago people are reputed to be peaceful and hardworking. But then, as now, they are all the indigenous peoples of Sudan faced by precarious circumstances. When Bakita was five or six years old, slave raiders kidnapped her elder sisters, and three years later, while she was strolling outside the village with a friend, she was also kidnapped. In, 19, in 1883, Bakita was brought and taken to Italy. She was bought and taken to Italy. She made her profession in 1896 with the Canotians, is that how we pronounce it? Canotians? Canotians, and was assigned to a convent baptized and confirmed Josephine Margaret Maria Bakita on January 9, 1890. At the age of 30, after three years of religious formation, she made her profession of vows as a member of the Canosian Daughters of Charity. She will spend her remaining 45 years of her life dedicated to assisting her community and teaching others to love God. Through prayer, she devoted herself to the welfare of her African brothers and sisters, as well as to all who crossed her path. Throughout her life, she demonstrated only sympathy and forgiveness towards her former captors and oppressors and prayed for them continuously. <clears throat> she tells us that from an early age, she was drawn to the beauty and mystery of nature, the rising and setting of the sun, the bright night skies, the flowers and plants of all kinds. Often she asked herself, Oh, who is the master of all these beautiful things? How I would like to meet him and pay him homage. We are honored today to have Ibrahim An Anli, Executive Director, Rumi Forum, Sufi, Rabbi Jerry Sarota, Jewish, 
Harun, or Harun if he's not here today, director of, oh, let's see, we have Roya Bowman Bahai, and the National Center for Youth Law. And we have Dr. Richard Arwala. Interfaith Outreach Coordinator for the Chimmaya Mission Washington Regional Center, Hindu. Our theme today is what does weaving the peace look like? What does weaving peace look like from faith perspectives with different threads? To save time, I am sure you would read about the bios of our distinguished speakers online. And since we really have this in very, very great conversation that's gonna happen, I want us to really maximize on their time. I am not going to tell you what is interfaith dialogue or why it's important to have this conversation. I'm not going to go into that. What we're going to talk about is it is very important for us to look at this work towards peace, reconciliation, understanding, deep listening to each other as a critical act of social justice. And so our discussion today will center around how you weave threads of peace and how together we weave this beautiful cloth of peace. We're going to take turns as we speak, and so I'm going to give everyone a chance. Um, once you, you know, we'll talk maybe two to three minutes to respond uh, to the questions, and then we'll, you know, continue our dialogue. And there will be time for Q and A later on. I will make sure there's time. So our first question will be: Tell us briefly about the core beliefs and principles of your faith tradition. And Richard, maybe we can start with you. You want to kind of keep things well quiet? As you wish. Speak and take it off. Yeah, so for Hinduism, the most core belief is that there is only one universal consciousness. And the plurality that we see in the world is just many different manifestations of the same divinity. So uh, while many people consider Hinduism as polytheistic, it's actually not polytheistic. It says there is one divinity only. And if you really think about it, what it means, it's, it actually goes even beyond there is one God. It says there is only God. So each person, each individual, each uh, uh, anything and everything you see in the world is a manifestation of God itself. It's not something different from it. At the same time, it recognizes the plurality. So uh, what you have is very many paths based on the temperaments of people. So different people have different temperaments, so not everyone is going to want to do the same thing. Similar to not everyone wants to learn the same things in college, it's essentially like that. We are in, in a college. The world is a college for us, teaching us lessons, and everybody learns in different ways. So there are a lot of different paths people can follow, but the ultimate goal is to connect with that divinity so we can see the divinity in us, around us, and that by itself then leads to no fear of anyone. If everyone at the substratum level, at the base level is the same, there is no fear, and if there is no fear, peace and non-violence become byproducts of that philosophy. So in my less than two minutes, I think that's the best I can do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just one minute. Mm -hmm. Leslie, did I call your name? No. My apologies. So Leslie is my mentor and my closest human. <laughs> <laughs> and my apologies, Leslie Coven, uh, Network. No. Hey, I have not even noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi, please go ahead. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, take one of your minutes, uh, Richa, Dr. Right. Richa, because uh, one of the things that I learned from our common teacher, Dr. Siva Subramanian, uh, I was very proud as the 
the executive director of the Interfaith Council in Metropolitan Washington, try to learn from all the faiths I encountered. So I once said to, uh, of course, when I greeted uh, Dr. C, I, I would say, Namaste. So I, I, under, I understood in my, my own worldview that I was bound to the image of God in the other person. That was the way I would have expressed it. And Dr. Shiva said, no, you're not bound to the image of God in the other person. You are bound to the divinity in the other person. So that is, that is one of the ways that we learn from each other uh, uh, and among the differences. And it, there's a difference between bowing to the, the reflection of God and bowing to the God that's in, in front of us and the other person. So that, that, that's my minute on Hinduism, not on Judaism. <laughs> so, um, uh, Rabbi Hillel was a contemporary of Jesus in historical terms, uh, was once asked by a very impertinent questioner, uh, teach me Judaism while I stand on one foot. Oh. Uh, and he had an answer. He, he said, do not do unto others what you would not have them do unto you. The rest is commentary. Go and learn. So it is possible to, to, to take one teaching, but I have a couple other versions of that. There was a discussion in the Talmud, which is the rabbinic commentary that's part of the revelation of God, even though it's written down by human beings, about which is the primary verse in the Torah. Um, and from which all the other verses can be derived. And Rabbi Akiva said, uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then as I said, no, 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 no. That's not the primary verse of the Torah. The primary verse is from Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Um, uh, these are the, uh, this is the history of the human being created in the image of God, male and female. That's the verse from which we can learn everything. Because loving your neighbor is something who's like yourself is a very limited proposition. But loving all of humanity is a much more central uh, way of understanding the teaching of God. There are three basic commandments uh, connected with love in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, we've already mentioned the love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Those two commandments will be uh, very familiar to those of you from the Catholic tradition. There's a third commandment uh, uh, also in the book of Leviticus. You shall love the stranger. You shall love the one who is not like you, who is the immigrant, uh, who is, has the status that you had when you were slaves in the land of Egypt, you were geirin, the Hebrew word. So the, these three commandments of, of love are an axis around all of uh, Jewish, uh, around which all of Jewish tradition uh, revolves. Um, there are many commandments uh, in the Torah, according to Jewish tradition, 613. But there are two, and many of them, we don't have the chance to do in our lifetime. If we don't own a field, we can't leave a corner of the field for the poor, the widow, and the orphan, or the stranger. You can't do that unless you, you own property, to, to leave some, the part that doesn't belong to you. Um, but there are two commands that you're not only commanded to do them, you're commanded to pursue them. Uh, tzedek, tzedek tirdof, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, Justice, justice shall you pursue, and peace. Bake shalom varofehu. Seek peace and pursue it. Peace and justice are two qualities in the world that run away from us. We need to pursue after them. They're not always in front of us to do. So the command to pursue is connected with seeking justice um, and uh, seeking peace. Uh, those of you who know the, uh, the scripture well know that where it says justice, justice shall you pursue. The Hebrew word is tzedek tzedek tzedek, it's repeated. And since this is a revelation from God, God doesn't stutter. There must be some reason why it says tzedek tzedek tzedek, as it were. 
we, we speak in human language, so we speak about God only the way humans speak about God. So you'll forgive the, the metaphor, but there's, that's an opportunity for us to say, this must mean more than just pursue justice. You need to pursue justice, just ends by just means, uh, which I think is an essential teaching uh, of Pax Christi uh, uh, that we celebrate the 50 years. Uh, an unjust means will not get you to a, a just end. And I'll take one more, I'm not sure where I'm in time, but I'll take one more verse that's a peculiar verse if I had to pick a, another one of the commandments that, that, that probably not, few of us uh, have ever had the opportunity, will have the opportunity to do. In the book of Exodus, chapter 23, verse 5, um, if you see the, en the donkey of your enemy suffering under a burden that's too heavy, uh, you shall go and assist that donkey to raise the burden. Now, why would we be commanded to such a uh, peculiar uh, thing to do? I mean, it's kindness to the animal, but it specifically says the, the, the donkey of your enemy. Um, this creates cognitive, cognitive dissonance. If our enemy sees us lifting up the burden from the poor animal, the enemy will be confused about uh, who we are and what, what is this en enmity between us. It's a nonviolent uh, strategy to confront enmity between human beings. So it's a very interesting uh, um, command to think about. Uh, we're commanded, the, according to the Talmud again, to be the disciples of Aaron, seeking peace and pursuing after peace. We're not, not commanded to be like Moses, uh, but like Aaron, who is understood in the tradition to be the quintessential peacemaker. Um, and that is, that is the role model. Uh, um, even when the people were, were going wrong, Aaron was somehow able uh, to bring people back um, uh, through means of compromise. Uh, the Hebrew Bible has a high value, and the Jewish tradition, a high value in arbitration and mediation um, as, a, as superior uh, to I'm right and you're wrong. There has to be some way to see the rightness in the other side. And that is what uh, being a disciple of Aaron means in the Jewish tradition. Uh, so, hello everyone. My name is Roya Bauman, and I'm here to talk about some of the principles of the Baha'i Faith. Um, some of you may not know very much about the Baha'i Faith, so um, allow me to set a little bit of context. Um, so, basically, when, when it comes to the subject of nonviolence or peace or justice, the, the very pivot around which all the teachings of the Baha'i Faith revolve is the principle of the oneness of humanity. And uh, the founder and prophet of the Baha'i Faith took a title, um, Baha'u'llah, which in Arabic means the glory of God. The Baha'i Faith itself was founded, was born in Persia in 1844, and has a very interesting history. Um, that traverses continents and countries um, where Baha'u'llah himself was exiled and was a prisoner and eventually ended up in Palestine in the 1860s. So that's why some of you might have been to Israel and have visited Haifa, which uh, in those environs is the seat of the Baha'i world, both spiritually and administratively. And that's, that's how that came about, which was his exile as a prisoner of, prisoner of being gradually um, moved from place to place because his influence kept growing wherever he was. But so Baha'u'llah brought these teachings, um, and so the oneness of humanity is the actual purpose of the Baha'i teachings. And it rests on, I guess you could say, um, in a sense, three principles or pillars that Baha'is like to call the three onenesses, the oneness of God, the oneness of religion, and the oneness of humanity. And so um, 
when you think about um, religion, Baha'is uh, view religion as a constant, um, eternal um, process that God is providing guidance to humanity in a manner that is eternal in the past and eternal in the future. So God's guidance never ceases. And so it's a concept we call progressive revelation. Um, Baha'u'llah himself said that the peoples of the world, of whatever race or religion, derive their inspiration from one heavenly source and are the subjects of one God. So it's a concept that there is only one God, regardless of what title by which we call that entity, Yahweh, Allah, uh, the Great Spirit, Creator, God. It all depends on whatever language you happen to speak, right? So basically, the world's religious systems are all expressions of one progressively revealed divine plan. Um, there's a helpful analogy um, that sometimes Baha'is like to use as religions are the chapters of one book. So um, religion, uh, the message of a particular uh, divine manifestation of God 5,000 years ago will have been geared towards the particular needs and the level of spiritual maturity of humanity at that time. And as humanity is always constantly progressing, as civilization is always progressing and uh, changing, as humanity is maturing, God needs to continually provide guidance in accordance with the needs of humanity at any given time. And so that's that concept of progressive revelation, but it's an eternal process. So um, the, one of the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, this contributes to helping understand, um, as Dr. Rishi, did I say your name right, Dr. Rishi? Um, Risha um, said exactly as Hinduism teaches, there is one universal consciousness and that all of it is God. That is in complete harmony with everything the Baha'i faith teaches. And so when you look at humanity and as religions, instead of being as uh, competing systems or um, you know entities that aren't in harmony with one another, of course you're going to be um, focused on the differences rather than the similarities. But if your construct in general is one of um, eternal guidance that upon which you know each faith builds upon the teachings of the previous one and then offers new teachings that are relevant for right now, then it gives you a whole new view of how to view, you know, how to look at religion. And then the last piece, of course, is um, the oneness of humanity, which is focused upon the teaching that um, every human being is a possessor of a soul, and the soul proceeds from God and returns to God, and we all have a soul. And Baha'u'llah said, know ye not why we created you all from the same dust, that no one should exalt himself over the other? Ponder at all times in your hearts how you were created. Since we have created you all from one same substance, it is incumbent on you to be even as one soul, to walk with the same feet, eat with the same mouth, and dwell in the same land, that from your inmost being, by your deeds and actions, the signs of oneness and the essence of detachment may be made manifest. So basically, that's kind of the foundation on which um, the Baha'i faith you know, talks about the oneness of the entire human race, of all religions, and of God, and how it ties into, thus, if you approach reality and life from those perspectives, there is no need for antagonism, prejudice, mm -hmm. or to be non uh, to be violent or non-peaceful towards one another. It's all part of one holistic, um, grand system. Thank you, Ray. So just for those that are coming in, um, the question is, tell us briefly about the core beliefs and principles of your faith tradition 
on non-violence, peace, and justice. Thank you very much. Um, a, a Muslim walks into a bar. <laughs> yeah, admit it, that was not the introduction you were expecting. <laughs> um, and uh, well, that could be what kind of Muslim? So that could be a literalist Muslim and could have a very hostile attitude to the, to the scene inside the bar. And, uh, or that could be not a literalist, by, but a legalist Muslim who would not, neither enjoy nor express any hostility, just walk in and walk out. Or that could be a Muslim uh, with, uh, with Sufi underpinnings and inspirations. And his or her response could be, oh Lord, they seem to be enjoying their moment. Please make sure that this will continue into eternity. So not that this person has a disregard of the law and the ban of Islam on alcohol. Sufis uh, come from the heart of orthodox learning of it. So they don't have a disregard of the law, but they have a transcendent agenda, which is nothing introduced into Islam later on, but comes from the fault of Islam. And that's after this um, uh, brief joke, the, the first Muslim into a, walked into a bar a joke into the literature. That's what I'm going to introduce, try <laughs> to introduce. So uh, a man approached the, the prophet, peace be upon him, and asked what belief is, what faith is. And the prophet listed the key concepts and constituents of Islamic faith, uh, which has six pillars. And then the man asked what Islam is. And he listed key practices of Islam. So another checklist of five uh, items. And then he asked what ihsan is, which means in, in the very dictionary translation, to beautify. And he said, uh, it is to, to worship your creator as if you can see, uh, because even if you, you cannot, your creator will see. So ihsan comes from the word hasan, beautiful and to beautify or beautified and to to our contemporary understanding it translates as kind behavior so islam in its very essence is kind behavior it is just like just like many other traditions that that we know of has strong um, textual, legal, uh, literal uh, underpinnings and pillars and uh, teachings, but it is, ideally, it is anything but a spiritless legalist. And at the core of this lies the concept of uh, Ihsan. When Sufis were organizing from the 12th century onward, they were criticized by the legalists that this is something foreign to the core of religion. And they are introducing something foreign into Islam. They said, no, we take it directly from the, uh, the, this very hadith, this very teaching of the prophet, peace be upon him. The entire foundation stone, cornerstone of our school is the concept of Islam. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm Leslie Caldwin, and I am Catholic. And at the heart of Catholicism is a belief in a, re a God of relationship. God who loves us 
so much that God creates in God's image. Another aspect of that is moving into um, an idea of the same loving God being incarnate, coming into humanity as a person of no great esteem or status, one who is in deep relationship with the Creator and identifies the Creator as Abba, implying an intimate relationship with the divine. This incarnation, this, um, the act of, so the act of incarnation goes from the moment that this person who we identify as Jesus, from the moment that his coming is announced, and it goes even to be a human, is to step away from that power and authority of the divine, but to live as a simple person, to experience the challenges in life, the highs and lows, the celebration and struggle. And one who teaches us how to love, teaches us through the use of stories and parables, because they are able to reach the human heart in a way that direct, direct instructions sometimes allow us to think in binary terms, but in moving into stories and parables, we are able to appeal to a deeper humanity within us. One of these stories is of the Good Samaritan when he is asked, when Jesus is asked about the greatest commandment and the person that is to love God with all of my being, to love my neighbor as myself, and then it's who is my neighbor. And so the story of the Good Samaritan is used to express who one's neighbor is. It is not the person who is like you. It is the person though who is who is willing to help you in your moment of need. Jesus also teaches us how to see ourselves. There is the story of, uh, or, or the, the statement of turning one's cheek, and awfully that is taken and understood, incorrectly understood, that Jesus is calling us to be a doormat. <laughs> that is not what turning the other cheek means. So for example, if I were to strike Josie, whom I love, so I'm not going to strike Josie. <laughs> <laughs> but if I'm going to strike Josie, I'm going to do it with the back of my right hand I would strike her across her face, across her cheek, with only my right hand, not my left hand, because there are cultural, there are cul cultural differences, and in some cultures, you only touch another person with your right hand. The left hand is for bodily function. 
And so you think when you are eating a meal at a table, you want to be sure that everyone's hands clean. So it's the right hand, okay? So if I slap Josie across the cheek with the back of my right hand, it is insulting her because it's the back of my right hand. Jesus says, turn the other cheek. So Josie turns her face so that then I am forced to hit Josie with the palm of my hand. And in doing so, I elevate her status. Okay, so that then she is my equal. We are equal. The night before Jesus died, he did a foot washing. He washed the feet of his disciples. Imagine living in a time and place where you are walking and you don't have on shoes or you have on sandals and you have animals all across. When I go to Josie's house, Josie will have someone there to wash my feet, a servant. But this servant would not be someone that we considered equal to us. So that's the, the power of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And the reason that Peter is so upset about that is because he realized what Jesus is doing. So those are examples of how we are to live in respecting each other and serving each other. The life of Jesus ends with the crucifixion and death, but we believe that Jesus is resurrected into new life. And that the teaching is for us to teach what he has taught us and that in his absence the Holy Spirit the third of this relational that I speak of as, as God comes and anoints creation and guides us in discerning how to live in this world Thank you, Leslie. So we are sometimes made to believe that we make peace by avoidance. The peacemaker knows that there is no peace without healing, and there is no healing without tough conversations. What are the struggles and challenges that exist around and within your faith that pulls us apart and tears away on the fabric of peace building? What are the blind spots and struggles within your tradition that needs to be overcome. Rachel? Yeah, so uh, the answer is at two levels. One is how, what are the struggles within the tradition and the one is how does it manifest in the world with other traditions. So within the tradition, one thing to understand is that Hinduism is a really, really ancient religion uh, which has no founder, no single book. It's a library that we have to uh, look at and understand and also uh, it's because of the longevity uh, it grew in the practices grew over time to suit the times uh, and changed over time and because it intrinsically says people have different temperaments and multiple paths uh, different people within the group may think that their practices or their way of approaching God is the best so even within the tradition, you can have this kind of uh, tension or misunderstanding to say that my way is, or the way I practice Hinduism is the best way to practice Hinduism. Uh, but that's obviously a struggle uh, within the uh, Hinduism tradition. And uh, then uh, the other, but um, again, if somebody really understood that these are different paths leading to the same uh, goal, then there will not be that tension. On the other hand, uh, especially in the West, Hinduism is uh, not understood or worse, it is misunderstood in many ways. Um, 
as an example, I mean, the yoga tradition, people just think of asanas, uh, physical postures, and breathing as yoga. That's not at all what it, yoga truly is. Yoga means to unite, and the goal of the whole practice is, is to unite with the higher. So even with just a limited, uh, very, very small part of that whole system, if people are benefiting so much, just imagine how much more people can benefit if they actually uh, took the whole system into account. And uh, part of the resistance comes from because uh, people think to practice the entire system, you have to become Hindu. There is nothing like that. I mean, any uh, Hinduism does not proselytize. So uh, because of that, uh, it's not like we are looking for, to for people to convert be before you can practice that system or even part of the system. So that's one a aspect. The other one is many of the symbols are misunderstood. I mean, and this I can go on forever, but for example, the swastika, which has been in the news uh, uh, quite a bit, uh, Hitler actually never even used the word swastika ever. And uh, the word he had used was Hakenkreuz, which is hooked cross. And if you look at uh, the Benedictine symmetry, um, uh, sorry, and, and the uh, German Christian flag of the time, there is a cross and an angled, uh, what is now called swastika, on that. So his inspiration actually was the German uh, Christian flag. And the other word he used was Aryan. Aryan in Sanskrit means noble, not superior. So again, the two things were taken completely out of context while the translations were made. And one by him, when he thought Aryan was superior, and one by the translators of his main terms who translated Hakim Kroyas as swastika. And now people are wanting to ban swastika. We have complete uh, understanding of how hurtful the Nazi flag is and the Nazi symbols are. At the same time, it's not appropriate to ban a uh, symbol of religious peace, which actually means su, uh, swastika is su and asti, well-being of all. Literal translation of swastika is well-being of all. So, uh, and that's a very sacred symbol for us. So it's, it's as if you're banning the cross for Christians. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's again a misunderstanding from various uh, things and uh, uh, similarly, uh, caste is associated as if it's come from Hinduism. Again, there it is temperaments, which is misunderstood as if people were stratified uh, based on uh, uh, their uh, birth. It was not the case at all. So those are three examples of things uh, that are badly misunderstood, which create a problem in terms of how Hinduism is perceived in the West, especially, or by others, and there's a lot of education that needs to go in to make sure that these things don't affect, especially the next generation um, who don't really even relate to or can't even understand where the confusion is coming from. Um, at least for once, uh, people like my, uh, from my generation who came from uh, East, we have the understanding from both ends, but uh, our children are like, what is caste? My, just my, the other day, my son asked me, what is my caste? I am being, he's in California, and I'm like, you don't need to know. It's not a real Hindu concept. It's not something you need to worry about, but he's being asked. So um, that's the thing. And then he says, at least tell me it's a good cast. I'm like, don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't even go there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't need to go there. So uh, those are the, our struggles in terms of uh, how we can move further from just based on education and making sure people have a better understanding of the whole system. Thank you. So Judaism's uh, self-concept goes back to the story of Abraham, Ibrahim, Sarah, and Hajar uh, as a people. I mean, they were an individual family, but from that family descended a people, um, and um, the, the people as a collective strives at its best to be a holy people. But once you have a particular family and a particular people chosen, as it were, to be an example, you have a problem, uh, or you can have a problem, of uh, ethnocentrism. 
You can even have it in a beautiful faith-like Hinduism uh, when misunderstood. Uh, maybe Richa will talk about that, or uh, maybe you'll have questions about that. But if your if your particular faith is the one channel, uh, the one path to the one God, then you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. Mostly, we see this problem with Western. Uh, faiths, with the faiths that descend from uh, Judaism more directly, uh, Christianity and Islam, um, uh, that all of us have this uh, potential problem of, uh, of um, ethnocentrism. Now, you can overcome that if you see those religions that follow in your path as uh, uh, one scholar said of uh, Christianity and Islam, daughter religions of Judaism. So they're, they're part of the same family. Uh, but even that, if you exclude those who aren't part of that family, like the Dharmic mm -hmm. faith, you do have a problem. And that, that is a problem of, that we have, those of us who are part of Western traditions have, that uh, we have a tendency to, to ethnocentrism. Um, uh, our community is the holy community, and our way is the, the way. Um, that's a problem of religion, not so much of faith. The faith is with the faith of one God, which we hold in common. But the religions can tend to, as they develop by human beings, can be very divisive. It's, uh, perhaps Ibrahim will uh, uh, cite the text of the Quran, which is my favorite text, um, if he doesn't, I will later, uh, as to why God created more than one religion. Uh, why didn't God only create one? Uh, if Judaism was a wonderful path, uh, why would there be other paths chosen? And the Quran gives an answer, so I won't, I won't give that answer right now, but it's a beautiful answer. Um, I would say that there's a hint of this in the biblical story of the Tower of Babel, um, where that it looks, lo looks like a wonderful thing. The whole earth was of one speech and one language and had one purpose, build a tower to the heavens. So that sounds like an ideal uh, state where everybody has one language. Um, and apparently that's not an ideal state. The rabbinic tradition is they were so focused on this task of building a tower to the heavens that when a person fell down off the tower, they didn't take they didn't make any trouble to, to bury that or care about the person. But if a brick fell off, they mourned for a week because they, they were focused on their tasks. And what it really is is a description of totalitarianism uh, and not of, uh, not of human, of harmony. Harmony requires many voices. Maybe Royal will sing. Uh, she's got the most beautiful voice, uh, one of the most beautiful voices I've ever heard. Uh, but. The, uh, the, the harmony requires more than one voice, more than one language. So in this story, there's a hiddenness that God wants pluralism, uh, not one faith and one language. Uh, third problem that uh, you will easily recognize, and I know there was a workshop on this subject, uh, uh, is the problem of landedness, of the ind indigeneity, of being an indigenous people in a land. Uh, and a treating land as holy, a particular piece of land, um, and uh, the idea that God is a real estate agent to, that designates land here or designates land there and not to be shared uh, is, a, uh, is a heavy burden. And um, the Native American traditions and others who follow with that spirituality from the land, you know, ask the land, but you've all heard this story, uh, this piece of land. Ask, ask the land uh, to whom does it belong. And the, uh, the answer, it doesn't belong to anybody. We belong to it. But these traditions that have a history in connection with uh, indigenous places or places that are holy, whether they're rivers or lands or, um, or real estate, um, that's a problem that has to be, uh, has to be overcome. Um, and um, so land, landedness is a challenge uh, if it's not combined with the rest of the wisdom uh, uh, of any one of the traditions that, that are speaking today in front of you or the ones who aren't here uh, as well can have that problem as well. That's, that's where we have, 
That's the healing that we have to do. Thank you. So I'm going to, uh, Dan is standing there with a the green shirt. Dan, you can sit down, but you please keep an eye on him. He's going to time us because we have some really good questions and we're going a little over time. So when Dan raises his little notebook, know that you're running out of time so we can get to all the great questions we have. Roya, right, go ahead. Okay, I'll do my best. I told Josephine at the outset that I had so much fun um, you know, preparing answers to these questions. I could go on for hours about every single one, so I'll just try to <laughs> constrain myself. So first of all, um, in response to some of what uh, we were just hearing, um, well, first of all, in response to the question that Josephine um, provided us with, which was what are the struggles and challenges existing around and within our faith that pull us apart, etc. So I'm just gonna put this right out there that there is nothing within the Baha'i faith in any of its teachings or laws that pulls people apart. Um, however, um, because as I said, um, the overarching purpose of the Baha'i faith is peace that is built on a foundation of unity and justice and a recognition of the oneness of humanity. Um, it's human beings themselves, <laughs> which as you know, um, Every religion comes to humanity in its purest form. It's God's guidance. It's like what I like to call God's um, handbook for life. Those religious teachings that are brought by the messenger or the divine manifestation. But it's what people do with those teachings over the um, following centuries that create the division and that we end up with. And that's another reason that God is constantly renewing religion and reminding us of the true essence of faith, which are those spiritual teachings. And if you put the spiritual teachings of every faith next to each other, they are almost identical. And the golden rule, which Rabbi Jerry spoke about, is one of those examples. It's in every religion. So, um, so I would say that it's what humanity does with the teachings over the you know, centuries following the first a glimpse of a particular revelation that creates the, the um, pulling us apart and tearing at the fabric. So, uh, in fact, uh, the Baha'i faith, in the, there were many talks given by the son of Baha'u'llah around um, what is causing all these difficulties. Okay, so I'm going to share one quote and then stop talking. <laughs> uh, I got the sign. So, um, among the teachings of Baha'u'llah is that religious, racial, political, economic, and patriotic prejudices destroy the edifice of humanity. Yep. I'll just say it again. Religious, racial, political, economic, and patriotic prejudices destroy the edifice of humanity. As long as these prejudices prevail, the world of humanity will have no rest. And so um, we're given teachings to help us overcome those prejudices, the traditions we may have been raised with, and help us to get closer to the consummation of the thought of the oneness of humanity. Thank you. Uh, so I'll begin with quoting, not verbatim, that, uh, but that uh, verse from the Quran which comes uh, from the chapter named Hujurat, which means cells or little rooms, talking about uh, the, the early uh, the prophet's residence, which com composed of very few uh, little rooms. And the 13th uh, verse of that chapter reminds God created you all in different clans and tribes and peoples so that you may know one another. So it's, a, it's certainly a divine will, and it's, it's a divine choice, and uh, any, any act based on religious, confessional, denominational, uh, racial, uh, of disregard or hostility to differences is, is a direct rebellion to that divine choice. We, we can comment it uh, this way. So, 
to talk about the, the, the Muslim dynamics and, and challenges with regard to meaningful interface work and engagement. Um, what I observe is the <coughs> uh, is two challenges. One I would call rather a superiority complex and the other an inferiority complex. With superiority complex, what I'm what I mean is uh, this idea of um, of course this novel and uh, very Islamic understanding of Islam being the perfect avenue towards God. And, and everyone will have a similar understanding of his or her own faith. And that's more uh, welcome. But um, there is this false dichotomy of this being contradiction with interfaith work, as if we are compromising or diluting our faith. No, it's, and this is not limited to Muslims, but it's a universal thing. Mm -hmm. Everyone will be proudly anchored in their faith, and uh, differences are equally meritorious to discover and navigate, to talk about and disagree about. Um, and, and this doesn't contradict with being equally open to engaging with the other. Uh, hence our namesake, Rumi. Rumi comes from, he's a jurist. He comes from the heart of Sunni orthodoxy. But on top of that, he was able to build this school of spiritual Sufi openness and engagement. Inferiority complex uh, is something that is uh, causing some reluctance to interface work. I would you know, summarize it as, as the uh, trauma of the 20th century, mm -hmm. humiliation, uh, hu a humiliating defeat, uh, perceived or real, you name it, but uh, against the secular Western uh, world. And this trauma running deep, uh, all, even into sometimes second, uh, third generation Muslims, causing some reluctance to um, interface work. And finally, the need for re-engaging with certain medieval concepts that were constructs that are not uh, essential Islamic concepts, but th that were responses, Muslim responses to medieval world, the realities of the medieval world. Uh, I'll just give one example. So in, in those ages of, of the Mongolian invasions, Crusades, there was this, the Muslims coined this concept of Darul Harb and Darul Islam, the abode of war and abode of Islam. Uh, one is a Muslim sovereignty, the other is not. The borders are very clear. And, um, and this was asked to our honorary chairman, uh, Imam Fethullah Gülen, uh, how would you describe today's world? Is it Darul Islam or is it uh, Darul Harb? A boat of war or a boat of Islam? He said the entire planet now in this age is Darul Hizmet. It is the abode of service to fellow humans. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is a liberating scholarly commentary. So um, there is a great deal of Muslim uh, homework, if you will, uh, to go into those concepts reinterpret them or just totally remove them, coin new ones so that uh, we can liberate some of our fellow Muslims from those uh, restricting understandings. So earlier I mentioned that Jesus used <coughs> parables and stories to teach. And in the earliest days of Christianity, Christians were on the margins of society. And it was not until the state embraced Christianity that the threat was lifted. However, The 
the state ended up, because of its power, compromising and distorting what was the heart of Christianity. And unfortunately, throughout history, that led, that led to what we refer to as colonization. It led to the genocide of indigenous people in the West. It led to the kidnapping and enslavement of my ancestors. And the era of Jim Crow that led to the civil rights movement Unfortunately, there are too many leaders within the church who deny these shortcomings, who insist that we be patient, who are quick to claim that they are not racist without understanding that racism and prejudice are not the same thing. Within the Catholic tradition and within the mainstream Protestant tradition. And those shortcomings have become part of the system and structures that rule the society, and they are prevalent in the churches, in schools, in businesses and organizations, and even my beloved Catholic Church. has not recognized this reality as a whole. Thank you, Missy. Thank you, everyone. Peacemaking is not easy. It will not be easy. Sometimes we think it's impossible. How do we heal our faiths and heal our communities from these woundings? How can we overcome this work together and weave the threads of peace and justice from within with other faiths and the larger community? So this, uh, as I was telling Jerry before we started, so I got involved in interfaith work about 10 years back. And really it's been the journey of a lifetime in the sense that uh, not only it's about understanding the what other faiths are about, it's up any time you go and open your mouth, you learn more about yourself than about the other person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, it's really, that's one way forward is that you understand each other much better when you do this kind of interfaith work. And you understand the history much better also. So I'll give a couple of um, concrete examples of how we can do this work. And of course, Jerry is sitting next to me, who was the IFC president for, for the longest time. Um, so I'm rather a newbie in the, by comparison. Uh, one thing is, uh, I'm part of a book club called uh, All Faiths in Friendship. Uh, this is a women's uh, book club. It actually started out as an, uh, in DC there was just one for Abrahamic faith and the leader of the group said, why not uh, include other groups? And she expanded uh, or rather started a second group. And as part of that book club, we uh, read books about all other faiths, we visit each other's places every month. And that has led to such close friendships with all diverse faiths and traditions and cultures, and we understand each other a whole lot better. 
and we can talk very, very openly. Uh, I mean, like I mentioned swastika, and you, when I, as soon as you mention it in a group with the people in Jewish faith, you can see people who have understood and have kind of, and, and they're open about it, that this is something I just cannot see. Uh, it creates such deep hurt for me. Uh, and th that's one way, uh, that's starting a healing also. But at the end of the day, she accepted, if I see it in your temple, that's probably the only place where I can see it and not be offended. Mm -hmm. So uh, though that's one example. The other one is, uh, along with Jerry, we had uh, participated in uh, a unity walk that the IFC all does every year in DC. We basically replicated that in Montgomery County um, a few years back. And there you visit, uh, there it was open to general public. There you visit all different places of worship uh, and learn about them by actually visiting, the general public goes in. So that's another way of healing or coming to know. So bottom line for me has been education. So education, education, education in whichever way and the more open and honest that uh, communication can be, the better the results. Um, So as Richa said, there, there are strategies. Uh, we're lucky in D.C. that there's this one walk on Massachusetts Avenue where you can start at a, a Jewish uh, synagogue and you can get to a Catholic church next to it. Uh, and then there's several flavors of Protestant and there's the Islamic Center is on the same path. Uh, and there's uh, the Indian Embassy and the, the Gandhi statue. Uh, and they're all there. Uh, Buddhist Center, uh, the good, yeah, the Sikh Gurdwara. Uh, um, so we're fortunate, but we're only we have the opportunity. It's there. We can walk. Uh, this year, it's the it's the Sunday after Labor Day in the afternoon. Um, but there have been opportunities. Uh, I have seen Interfaith Council Metropolitan Washington. Uh, provides the opportunities for dialogues throughout the year. So that's the main strategy. There, there have been um, interfaith Ramadan uh, iftar celebrations, which is a one wonderful way, even if you don't fast, although fasting is always good for the uh, soul, <laughs> at least, if not for the body, uh, and participate in that whole month with uh, uh, the Muslim community, which is quite open and in, in, in this area for sure, as uh, the Rumi Forum uh, uh, is a wonderful resource in that regard. Uh, there are many interfaith seders. When I was a campus chaplain, we used to, uh, the core of the seder is uh, telling your story of liberation. Um, and uh, we had, we invited groups to tell their story of liber liberation or journey. Uh, we had the LDS, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, talk about their, their journey across the United, the United States. We had uh, ethnic groups, the Philippine Student Association. We had the, um, at that point, it was just the LGBT uh, Association. This is at George Washington University. Talk about their experience uh, in, in journey toward liberation. So the, the metaphors uh, and traditions of our faith can be shared, um, even if it, it doesn't change who we are as a person to be part of those celebrations. So uh, I recommend those. Uh, I, I, to me, the goal of them is to come to what I call uh, uh, theology of complementarity, um, which is used differently in some of the Protestant uh, traditions. But what I mean by it is that I need that my fellow, uh, my soul sisters and soul brothers, uh, uh, in order to be co to complete my journey, we all have pieces of a puzzle or part of a map. I see my and, and if we don't uh, engage with others, we won't get to where we're all trying to get to. Thank you, Reverend Jerry. Um, I mentioned that the Baha'i faith is still very young, born in 1844 in Persia. So there hasn't been a lot of time yet for human interests to um, start to change uh, 
the uh, core teachings or the practices of the Baha'i faith. Um, plus, there are safeguards actually designed in so that it minimizes the potential for that happening. Um, that isn't to say that Baha'is are not products of their culture, of the families in which we grow up, the traditions, the values, the prejudices, and so on. And in particular, in this country, um, the Baha'is in this country have been handed um, a unique challenge and opportunity, that of establishing the harmony and unity of black people and white people. And so I wanted to speak directly to my dear friend, um, your name yes. is Leslie. Yes. Um, to Leslie, I think you brought up a very critical, very critical issue here today that I want to make sure we spend a moment on, um, because um, the Baha'i faith in particular has teachings that are directly geared towards this very issue. Um, Baha'u'llah himself once compared and this is using the language of 1911-1912, so in which, at the time, um, black and brown people were called colored. So um, at a, a speech, at a talk that his son gave in um, the United States in 1911-1912, he said, Baha'u'llah once compared the colored people to the black pupil of the eye surrounded by the white. In this black pupil is seen the reflection of that which is before it, and through it the light of the spirit shineth forth. Another place, his son said, Thou art like unto the pupil of the eye, which is dark in color, yet it is the fount of light and the revealer of the contingent world. And I'm bringing this up because as far as I know, this is the first time in religious history, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the black and brown people of this world are recognized as possessing a special place in humanity's destiny, as being the pupil of the eye, the revealer of the continued world, and a source of light. And it's important for us to recognize that position that those people play for humanity. So I just wanted to say I heard you, and I just want to reach out to you in, um, with my heart to say um, I hope that healing can come soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So there is Eastern records, uh, a period of time that uh, Muslims tend to call the golden age, the first five centuries of Islam, a time of uh, immense scientific, artistic progress and uh, business success among Muslims. And uh, the, the main drive was curiosity. So Muslims were like this kid putting <laughs> his or her finger into the electric plug. Well, that, that's usually the he, not the her. Um, so, but that, that was the main drive. They were curious about everything. The heavens and the earth, whatever, was, whatever Quran was talking about, they were curious about. And it led to a great deal of advance in every direction. A very uh, fruitful, prosperous age. They were, it wasn't only future oriented, but they were translating the Greek texts. And which uh, was, a, a, you know, a very fruitful transition in the overall human history. So this notion of self-reflexivity um, has been replaced not everywhere, but in quite a number of places, unfortunately, with a sense of absolutism, which freezes your inclination to be curious about anything, including those who are different. And, um, and this absolutist sense, both in intra-Islamic discussions and also intra-faith uh, exchange, it has a freezing, infertilizing uh, effect. And this uh, needs to be replaced by rediscovering this 
um, long um, lost or eroded tradition of self-reflexivity and doubt and this uh, um, fertile uh, curiosity. The non-negotiables of Islam are maybe one page in full. The rest is, is commentary. Uh, so I'm very bad he left in that sense. <laughs> yeah, but, um, um, and, uh, and yeah, this, uh, th there is, I, I see promising change in the meantime, uh, the, 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 especially the, the, the freedom of expression in, 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 the, in the Western context, Western Europe, North America, is giving birth and facilitating to incredibly fruitful uh, discussions of, of Islam, uh, but the, the process is, is, that's working process, not over yet. beyond um, distortion that has, uh, in my opinion, has um, whitewashed the gospel of Christ, I think there needs to be truth telling, there needs to be education, there needs to be lamentation, there needs to be encounter. And what I have learned from friendships of people from different faith communities has enriched me and it has even enriched my own understanding of my Catholic faith. You know? Um, God is beyond what I can imagine and I can be in awe of how this that I cannot grasp or understand comes through my brothers and sisters of other traditions and also my own. And that goes back to um, the reason I think that Jesus used parables, I'm going back to that again, parables and stories, because it, it invites intellectual curiosity. It moves us beyond absolutism. It moves us from, we recognize this great mystery of life as being just that, and that no one has all of the answers. You know, um, faith is an, an, an invitation to, um, and I think whatever the faith tradition is, an, an invitation to breathe fully and freely with each other. everyone. So since we're running tight on time, I'm going to try to articulate both questions, the last questions that I have, and you will have two minutes to work your magic. <laughs> so I keep hearing relationships uh, essential to peace and justice work. Relationships help us see the humanity in the other, on the other side. So how do we what do you envy? What do you envy from other traditions that has helped you in your practice, in your own practice of peace and justice? How do you as faith leaders weave threads from many traditions collaboratively in this holy work? And how do we come to a greater meaningful whole? Excuse me, will there be time for questions? Because this is supposed to end in four minutes. We will try, so let's just have them answer quickly. Yes, we'll try to take a few questions. Thank you. 
So I think we have 30 seconds. So in terms of the envy, uh, as I said in the beginning, Hinduism is not, it does not have a founder, it does not have one book, and it's really a very personal uh, religion and not an organized religion in a way. So the organization helps people because if it's personal and left to you, you may not do anything. Okay? I mean, and that's a completely viable option uh, within Hinduism. So I definitely envy the organization that the Christian church has, the, society, the proper groups of, this is the group that's working on society, this is the work that's working on climate, this is the group. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like that in Hinduism. In, in fact, even within ourselves, we have to kind of organize to, so that we can have a representative at IFC <laughs> before um, that will happen. So that's something that's definitely envious and envious of. So I've already mentioned, um, very envious of the, and learned from the tradition of Hinduism to recognize the divinity, not just the image of divinity, but the divinity in every person. There are many prayer practices of other traditions that I've learned uh, uh, tremendously. Uh, the solidarity is the Muslim prayer line. Uh, it's a spectacular. You, you don't have spaces between the people you're touching. It's as if you're in one body of humanity uh, and on the Muslim prayer line. The, the, uh, we don't have any Protestants here, but I, I really envy the ability to be in the moment in, in prayer, uh, to pray from the heart authentically. I'm always looking, what's the right blessing to say? Which of the 560 blessings I know is the right thing to say at this moment instead of being open to the spirit, uh, which is something I see more, most clearly uh, in Christianity, particularly Protestant Christianity, though I have many wonderful Catholics uh, who can pray very much in the moment. So those are a few of the things that uh, the commitment to service of the uh, the Hindu uh, community, the LDS community, that the Latter Day Saints, uh, uh, and the generosity of the Sikh community through longer, the highest religious value is to feed as many people as you can feed. Wow, what a wonderful statement. So that there's just so much if we're open to it, we can learn from each other. And envy was, it's a term used by a theologian, Holy Envy is a lovely book by that title, but uh, Barbara Brown Taylor. Taylor. Uh, the concept is wonderful. You don't have to think of it and don't, do not envy. You think of what, what role models there are from other traditions. Thank you for explaining that, because um, I didn't understand that context of the interpretation of envy. I was going to say, Holy envy. Okay, I'll have to reflect on that. Um, I will say, probably the one thing that I, um, I guess you could say I envy about other faith communities is that because the Baha'i community is is so small in comparison, only maybe five to five million to six million people on the entire planet. Um, you know, it takes a lot more from an individual perspective to keep one's faith focused and moving forward. And it takes a lot of, of work. There's a very little ritual by design, so it takes a lot of discipline and focus to, to keep learning, to keep you know, working. Um, and so I'll also say I'm not a religious leader. There are no clergy in the Baha'i faith, so I wouldn't call myself a religious leader in any way. But I will, um, I will say that um, there is a process that the entire Baha'i world on, um, in every locality in every country is currently enacting right now, which we kind of call a community building process, which is in every locality, people are called to come forth together to pray, regardless of the uh, you know background of that prayer, bring it all, it's all holy, to learn together spiritually, to teach children um, spiritual education, um, and to then, as the community starts to coalesce around prayer and friendliness and fellowship, to start addressing the problems and the issues that exist in that local community together. So again, so bringing forth the spiritual um, knowledge and the, um, the insights that the entire community possesses to help solve local issues. And so that's a, that's a process that is ongoing all over the world. 
And I would say that is how Baha'is are trying to help create a meaningful whole. Yeah, any experience that reminds me the, the ultimate fact that uh, I don't monopolize, I don't have the monopoly over the truth and virtue and uh, I mean of human perfection. Any encounter that reminds me, that teaches me of that, triggers some holy envy with me. And uh, it, so, which means it will happen across the spectrum. I can, uh, I can certainly cite the, <coughs> the tradition of deliberation and critical thinking in, in Judaism on, on the study of Torah. And you know, not taking every idea for granted, but you know, approaching it with this questioning mindset. And, and my, I lived in Jerusalem for two years. My, my uh, best neighbors and friends were a Southern Baptist couple. <laughs> and, and you know, it was a rediscovery of Islam for me. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't think they were realizing this, but this is, uh, this is what happened. And we were in a Gurdwara this week. You know, again, it was a fresh, uh, refreshed testimony of this immense um, hospitality of the of the Sikh community and uh, you know there is there is no compartment of a faith tradition that will not trigger this sense of holy envy uh, with you as long as you are uh, open to learning mm -hmm. and and the two other rules that Christian Stendhal who suggested the concept of holy envy are don't compare your best with the other's works mm -hmm. and if you are curious ask those people not anybody else. Okay, so um, some of what I was going to say has already been said by others. So I will share um, one of my dearest friends uh, told me that she's Muslim and she said that when she prays five times a day, that there is nothing that can mock her stability. Mm -hmm. And I just love that, mm -hmm. that idea. Um, and also, in light of some other things I shared, what I appreciate about this novel is that you do not create an image of the divine. Mm -hmm. And I think that so many of our problems in Christianity mm -hmm. have come from Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm.